Okay, the first piece, uh, as if you don't know where poems come from, I worked at Lewis University. I was in early one morning, uh, washing my hands, and the water running out of the tap was ice cold. And it just never, ever warmed up. And I looked at the old guy in the mirror, and there was a poem there. The old man talks to his wife on a day he'll always remember. The water is slow to warm this morning, or perhaps I'm impatient to get this day moving, to get this day over and done with. Our mattress and covers entreat me, but the world demands. Tired of barn mice, the toms curls around my ankles as I toast the last loaf you made. Make too much bacon, break eggs into the pan, and his old voice is kitten high as he asks me, when did you become the cook? I set your place on the table. Two rough sawhorses I made when we were younger. An old bedroom door we used beyond its normal life. A plastic cup chalice for wine. A rough napkin charger for wafers. And a well-used white cloth for the resurrection. Why will we call this a wake? when I know you won't. I do an awful lot of acrostic poetry. Uh, visual arts uh, are wonderful triggers, especially this time in my writing period. You know, I, I need to come up with ideas, and I can't wait for inspiration to come along and smack me upside the head and say, hey, wake up and write. So I do a lot of looking at visual stuff. and. Uh, this comes from a photograph, unsourced from probably 43 or 44, of uh, a woman dancing with a Yankee flyer in London. Old woman with photograph. My husband was fighting in Italy. I have a photograph, him marching, taken on the road from the beach. I hadn't seen him for six months and didn't see him for another seven. You were in London on a weekend pass. I have a photograph of us dancing, taken when my friends and I stepped out. I'd never seen you before that evening, and I never saw you after it. I know the rest of my husband's story. I have boxes of photographs, us laughing, holidays with the children, their weddings. He passed a week before turning 80, and my love for him is still strong. But of you, my handsome Yankee pilot, I only have that photograph of us laughing. The corner of my faithful heart is still yours. No danger to my husband and our children. And I think that's all of the story I really want to know. Another good place for inspiration is uh, a dear friend of mine in Virginia, uh, the poet Mary Carol Hackett, who uh, in addition to putting out prompts every day of the year, sometimes two or three to catch up with days that she's actually had other things to do, uh, she puts together at holidays and special occasions uh, long lists of prompts and shares them with everybody who wants to use them for stuff. Uh, this one was fairly simple. It said, uh, make a poem about a triptych, which is a three-panel piece of art. Chronophobic triptych. Left panel. The old man attends the funeral. The words of the priest as comfort for those still confined who wait on their release with longing and anxiety. Centerpiece. He walks early spring streets as the yellow buses stop. He recalls when his children filled the sidewalks and lawns with noise and smiles and later first held hands. One August afternoon, newlyweds move in where the widow Johnson lived in a self-made nunnery. The kids on the block feared getting their ball from her yard. Her daughter and grandson visit a bit more often to keep at bay the leaves refilling his lawn like scarves cascading from the hat of a stage magici magician called upon to fill idle family afternoons. This many steps to the door this many more to make it down to the snow-touched driveway. Right at the corner, right, left, no, damn it, right, and right, home. 
fooled you again, Time. Right panel. Six men, good and strong, to carry the slight weight, the soulless shell left behind. Memories grow heavier, but in the end, in the end we leave them to burden other shoulders. The other thing Mary Carol Hackett is really good for is talking about things that are going on in her life. She's a college professor, she's a political activist, she is uh, a hell of a good writer. Uh, I feel like I'm standing in her shadow every time I read one of her books. And, uh, and, she, and she just speaks about things that are going on. Uh, she talks a lot about her dead husband and about her kids and stuff like this. A small package of great value. And one day, somewhere in the summer, when the seeds had turned to blooms, had turned to harvest, she sent him two tomatoes, the purple red of well and truly kissed lips, some translucent white onions, their swollen baby's fists lying at the base of long, sweet stems, a handful of small potatoes shining golden yellow through the earth that still swaddled them. There was no reason to send these. He had his own garden, well tended beneath another equally beneficent sky. No reason, but her heart insisted there was a need. Further down that road, uh, Sur le Pont d'Avignon. Uh, I think we all grew up with that, sh that song as we were kids. You know, uh, never tried to translate it, and I'm lucky I can pronounce it, but that's a whole different story. Um, we danced under parking lot lights. It seemed the place it seemed the moment to hold each other in a two-step, to whisper as our lips brushed of our love. This is how we lived, dancing without invitation or warning at a local food store grand opening. It's what we felt like. You wore a poodle skirt, pleasant bow, peasant blouse, Mary Jane's. I wore Bermuda's t-shirt, boat shoes. We wore our love like night lights on our sleeves. This is how we lived. People smiled, people clapped. Some seemed embarrassed and none joined in. Brief weeks later, you were gone. So I guess it's never not the place and not the moment. Shelter, one. She dreams about her husband in some deep night place where golden memories must take her. Might sadden, but can't really hurt. They live in pioneer style. A simple house, animals and children mixing in the yard, crops sufficient to their needs, and so much love struggles are eclipsed. He sings to her now in death as in life, at every opportunity, his voice echoes, and even friends who don't believe in heaven would testify that's where his music comes from. Two, their man-child wanders the house, minstrel singing his own doggerel in the French she taught while sitting at the kitchen table, paring potatoes, cutting garden-picked tomatoes, chopping lettuce from the next row of turned earth over. The garden she tends still grows. The harvest won't be done for years, long after she leaves this place to grandchildren not yet fully conceived. She sees her husband and their son, sees the future she now shapes alone, and thinks the world might be saved. Three, spring is here. Well, maybe not, but. <laughs> Red wings sing new dawns. The April sun takes the snow away softens the aches in early 50s bones, and it's time to do a little cleaning in that car. Tucked between the seats, not yet faded from too many years, she finds a simple note that takes her by surprise and makes her entire being smile at the handwriting. I'd go through all the shit again if it still led me to you. She reads it twice, holds it close before the first tear falls. 
Okay, a little less seriously, sort of. Um, everybody who's a poet has to have a vampire poem. <laughs> or so I was told once. I uh, co-moderated a writer's group online back in the beginning of this century. And uh, my, my partner in crime there had a thing about vampires. Not necessarily a healthy thing about vampires, but she had a thing about vampires. So this is one vampire's wish for Kai. Who told you vampires never age? That's a crock. I'll bet they told you we only drink the blood of virgins, too. Where do they get this stuff? I'm so old, virgins just don't do it. There have been so many. It gets boring, and frankly, I'm not all I used to be. You know what I mean? My joints ache when the moon throbs on the horizon. Thunder hurts my ears, and the rain is really hard to fly through. You try it sometime, okay? All I really want is someone to come home to. A woman to rub my feet and tell me I'm forgetful, but not batty. To sit around the house and have a cocktail with. And sticking with the science fiction, uh, the alternate realities and histories. Unhold. You've left a hole in the world as I know it. I find myself with gore-beating Bush, with Dre Dewey, in fact, defeating Truman. What you've done is provide final proof that we are not alone in the only universe. And you've done it by creating a parallel one without you. Absenting yourself from future history, you've left Germany and Japan victorious over both the United and Confederate States. We'll never stand in wonder together on lunar soil. Never sail for the Indies and discover more. And you can forget about our unborn children. And a weather report. It's raining in Oz today. Thunderstorms washing the monkey piss off the road and turning the yellow bricks back to gray. High winds whip straw like brown arrows, and paw-sized hail flattens the poppy fields, as if anyone can sleep through the thunder. Take your umbrella, the winged captain says to her. I don't need to listen to you whining again about the wicked little girl and her dog. <laughs> I am a regular at, well, I have been a regular up until the last year when a lot of other things got in the way. It, four different monthly venues in the Chicago area. Two in the, one in the city, one in Oak Park, one in Batavia, and the one in Aurora. And uh, I have a reputation, partially earned, I think, uh, as being the guy who writes love songs and war poems. Uh, and so let's move into the latter for a while. Four Asian still lights. One. Flying the first wave in at dawn, we crossed the tree line and began to take fire. And I, standing at the machine gun, closed my eyes and swung the barrel, praying blindly for some resolution. Two. At Fubai, to pick up ammunition, I'm wrapped in cartridges and flak vest, riding in a jeep with some lieutenant who'll be here driving generals when I'm in Hong Kong getting drunk. Three. Some Marine bled to death on the flight deck today. They flew six casualties in at one time, and all they could see to do was have the chaplain give him last rites. Four. I was going to write before, tell you all about the color of the sea here. But we took fire from the beach, so there wasn't really time. The sun is setting now, and it's the color of the sea. Five. Most of the time I do my killing from out at sea. We button up the ship and I sit in the radar room pulling the trigger when I get the word. I can see the rounds go out painting green spikes on my radar scope. And the forward air controller tells me when I get a hit, but I never know for sure if there's anybody there to hear the rounds exploding. Feel the thin flesh explode as well. Six. For the past nine days, we've been in Hong Kong. Beer's been good, and I bought some clothes. 
It felt funny to wear civilian stuff again. To see Asians and not be afraid. Today I saw the harbor from Victoria Peak. Took a cab past the racetrack. Saw water buffalo heads in the Aberdeen market and the dragons at the garden. It rained a while. British women look good when their hair is wet. Riding the escalators in the Hilton, I made a date with an American girl for nine in the evening, and neither of us kept it. I played dates in an alley with a, played darts in an alley with a Tommy, and she probably bought silks on the mainland side. Seven. If something happens to go wrong and I don't make it home, do you think you can remember me just for a few days before you start to cry? Uh, the thing about making the date with the American girl, uh, my ancestry is Norwegian and Swedish, and we were in Bergen, Norway in 1958 when the American fleet came in. And we're sitting at a restaurant up on a rooftop, and an American sailor made a date with the waitress. He spoke no Norwegian, she spoke no English. He pointed to his clock, set it to a time, she nodded, and presumably they met at that time. Who knows? I was nine years old and I found the whole thing very interesting. <sighs> Mother and child. Uh, I'm a Vietnam vet. Our oldest grandson drove trucks in convoys uh, in Afghanistan as a Marine. Uh, drew the lead, drove the lead truck with the mine rollers. Got blown up four times. Didn't get blown up a whole lot of other times when he probably should have. Uh, mother and child comes in part from that. When you were one, we spent the day at Disneyland. Your mother, my uncle, and I took turns watching you in your stroller from ride to ride. That night in your crib, you gazed wide-eyed for an hour, digesting, I guess, what you'd seen, and then smiled sweetly in your sleep. You won't remember it almost 50 years later, but we speak of it still. It's early in the fifth decade since that day, and your son is back from his war just as I was from mine. His gaze across the dinner table is hooded, distant. I hope when he's a father, he'll dream of wondrous times and fear that when he's a grandfather, he'll scratch at hidden scars and remember his bodies at the end of the day. Elegy also has a small story behind it. Lynn and I <sighs> raised and bred Bernese Mountain Dogs for about 20 years. And when you are a breeder of dogs, uh, every litter carries a risk with it, that there's a puppy that's not gonna make it to going to another home. Born too small, born with defects, whatever. Uh, we've got a small plot along the fence where there are not only some of our cats over the years, but some of these puppies. And digging one of those graves is where this elegy comes from. Dig the small grave and place the smaller body so, just so. The chill May rain and the warm human tears falling on her head will serve as the ritual washing of this pup, barely two days old. Some future digger after truth, alien or human, Kneeling with trowel and brush at this grave will note in clear, careful script their wonder that a people would be so deliberate with the smallest of their God's creatures and so careless of themselves. And let's see. Not all of my inspiration, I confess, comes from uh, looking at other people's artwork. Or taking other people's ideas. Sometimes it just takes a good trip to the store on a Saturday. Three and one. She has that look, that burned out, what the hell am I doing at Walmart on Saturday morning with three little kids look. That, geez, I'm so tired. Can I just lie here in the aisle, take a quick nap before I fall apart? And then the oldest makes the youngest laugh. And then the middleist says, Mommy, I love you. And she gets that other look. I'm going to leave you with uh, 
one more thing. Uh, I started writing in high school because of Carl Sandburg. Uh, in 1962, his uh, collection Honey and Salt was released and made its way into our high school library and I happened upon it by accident and I fell in love with words even more than I already was. And so I want to give you something from Sandberg, uh, his notes for, for a preface from his collected poems. I should like to think that as I go on writing, there will be sentences truly alive, with verbs quivering, with nouns giving color and echoes. It could be, in the grace of God, I shall live to be 89. And speaking my farewell to earthly scenes, I might say, if God had let me have five years longer, I should have been a writer. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.